colony. They were just completely foreign. It was a totally different culture. Most people never traveled from one colony to another. And as human beings, we are inherently suspicious of people who aren't like us. That is our nature as human beings. Not necessarily correct, but it's our nature. Right? We don't see everybody. It's not all for one and one for all. It's like my family, my community, maybe a little bit broader, my colony. But those people over there, no, they're strange and different. I don't understand their customs. They're not like us. They don't talk like us. They don't eat the same foods as us. They don't act the same as us. And so that's the general setting when you have the 13 colonies. And yet they all join together to fight the king, right? Why? Because there was an existential threat. And that threat drove them together. There was a king that was threatening their liberties, blockading Boston Harbor, and saying that he could do whatever he wanted to do. The cause of the American Revolution was not the Stamp Act. It was not the tea tax It was not broad British tyranny. Most of that really had no effect on most of the colonists. The thing was, the thing that caused the colonists to react was something called the Declaratory Act. The Declaratory Act was an act whereby Parliament, signed by the king, said, we can tell you what to do anytime we want to about anything, and you have nothing to say about that. And when the king issued the Declaratory Act, when Parliament passed the Declaratory Act, Sam Adams realized in his genius that this moment cannot stand. That is the dividing line between liberty and tyranny. If somebody in a kingdom far away can say, I can tell you what to do whenever I want, and you can say nothing about it, that is the very definition of tyranny, and that's what causes the colonists to react. That's what causes the colonists to say, this is an existential threat that cannot stand. And human beings are amazing because when we face an existential threat, we unify. Yesterday was September 11th. A lot of us are old enough to remember when those towers came down. Was the country unified? Yes, sir. Absolutely. We faced an existential threat. This is not anything, this is not alchemy or, or some kind of magical power. This is what happens when human beings feel threatened. We come together. That is the natural way we react. So we came together, we fought the American Revolution. After the American Revolution, an amazing thing happened. We won the American Revolution against all odds, in my opinion, because God's mighty hand of providence was upon us. We win the American Revolution. After the revolution is over, the most amazing thing happens is peace breaks out among the colonies and everybody loves each other. <laughs> it's not what happens. We go back to being human beings. And in fact, we form a government that demonstrates to us how much they disliked each other. We formed a government under the Articles of Confederation. And if you've studied that at all, you know that it was a government that gave the central government precisely no power. Why? Because people said, look, I don't trust you over my state. I'm not going to give you any power to make decisions for my state. I don't trust you with my state's trade. I don't trust you with our freedom of religion. There's no way I'm going to allow you to have a, any power in my state. So they create this powerless central government. And it doesn't work. It fails because it, it has no nothing that binds the people together. It has no power to tax. It has no power to pass laws that affect the colonies or now the states. And so it doesn't work. So in 1787, the states decide to get together in a convention. And that's that famous constitutional convention that we all know about. And this is the magic moment in American history when everybody starts to get along, right? (laughs) You know the story. In that hall, three months locked inside, no air conditioning, it's sweltering. I think hygiene habits not as good back then either. Everybody's probably pretty irritable. There's actually a lot of drinking going on, a lot of accusations, people slandering each other, people screaming and yelling at each other. Benjamin Franklin reports that the convention almost fell apart three different occasions and everybody was just threatening to go home. Thank God, and I do mean thank God, that old Ben Franklin called for prayer. And he reminded the men gathered in there, he said, we called on the mighty hand of providence during this very hall in the Continental Congress during the great revolution and God delivered us. And are we so stupid, he didn't use that word, but are we so stupid that we believe that now we don't need him any longer? And he called on the men there to pray and ultimately they did. By the way, this is another place that shows their division. So you've heard, probably everybody's heard that story. A lot of people have heard that story. And after that, they began to pray before they met. Except 
They couldn't agree on what kind of pastor or minister would lead the prayers. They were all from different denominations, and in fact, they had a rule at convention that they were not allowed to pay anybody, and pastors and ministers and priests back then all were prayer, they were all paid to give an invocation. So they ultimately decided they would all pay their own houses of worship and pray in the mornings before they came together in convention. Thank God they did, and out of that incredible meeting, we get all this division, all this strife, all this anger, all this distrust, all this hatred, and out of that comes the most amazing form of government ever invented by mankind for the preservation of liberty. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Yeah. And that form of government is called a federalist form of government. Now, this is amazing. Federalism is designed as a government for people who don't like each other. Because it says, look, there's certain things we have to do together because there's an existential threat facing our country, right? Back then it was England. England still would have loved to see the United States of America fall apart and step back in and take control. France had loaned us money for the war. They would have been just as happy to take control. Then Spain was a threat. And so there were international threats to this country. There was an existential threat, a reason for the country to retain its unity, but at the same time to acknowledge that the states had individual character. And so that charter, that incredible document that's now lasted almost 250 years, contains 17 original enumerated powers given to the federal government, all other powers reserved to the people in the states. Those powers unenumerated and infinite, essentially, right? And so you have the states are the power, and the central government is limited by the enumerated powers, and everybody agrees on that in convention, or most people agree on that in convention, and as they come out of convention and they go to ratification, it's amazing because everybody just loves each other. <laughs> no, ratification debates take place. The Federalist Papers, accusations of personal financial interest, there's hatred, there's slander, there's anger, but thank God, and I again mean thank God, he intervenes and we ratify the United States Constitution. And, and it has lasted now 250 years, the greatest founding primary document of any country in history. The average Constitution in the history of the world has lasted 17 years. And we're pushing towards our 250th anniversary. So we finally ratify the Constitution, and after ratification, what's amazing is the country just becomes totally peaceful and everybody loves it. <laughs> right? No division at all. So little division that by the 1860s we have a civil war. One of the greatest, most intense civil wars in all of world history. Over 700,000 people by the best counts we have either killed or maimed during that war. Brother against brother. City against city, families torn apart. This is what we did because the division was so intense. And at the end of that war, what happened at the end of the war is we were so divided that we forced a country, we forced a union on half of the country. Yep. Our history is a history of division. The country has always been divided. When you have a country as big and diverse as our country actually is, ideologically diverse, religiously diverse, I'm not talking about the kind of diversity that the crazy left is trying to push on, it's real thought diversity, real philosophical diversity, real religious diversity, real cultural diversity, when you have that, everybody's not the same, and they're never going to all be the same. So we come out of the Civil War, and you guys probably know your history better than I do, because you 